Everyone, welcome. As is usual for webinars hosted by us at the HBS Club of Toronto together with fellow clubs, it takes a little bit of time for the attendees to stream in, join the Zoom conversation. So we're just gonna give it a moment for folks to arrive. It is a pleasure to see a number of familiar names and others who are new, who are joining the conversation with us today. I am the president of the HBS Club of Toronto, and we're grateful for a collaboration with fellow Harvard clubs in Toronto, in Ottawa, British Columbia, also the HBS Club of United Kingdom, and members of this club joining us as well for the conversation. We are doing this session in honor of World Refugee Day. It's today, June 20th. And we are delighted about an intimate conversation with the Honorable Sean Fraser, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Jenny Lam, President of WEPAD, and Azar Lahar, Professor of Leadership and Human Resources at Seneca College and co-author of Journey to Home. This session is being recorded. So if you pose a question, and we hope that you will, uh, we will be very likely to name you. If so, your name will be on the recording. The questions are available to be made in the Q&A function as well as the chat function. We very much encourage you to not wait until the question and answer period, but formulate your questions, put them into the chat, put them into the Q&A function, and we will do our best to incorporate them into the conversation towards the end of the session. We are streaming the session from Toronto, and as a result, we acknowledge the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabek, the Chippewa, the Hidenosone, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the credit. It's a pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our guest of honor is Minister Fraser. The Honorable Sean Fraser was first elected as the Member of Parliament of Central Nova in 2015. And Minister Fraser previously served as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance, to the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity, and Associate Minister of Finance from 2019 to 2021 and as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change from 2018 to 2019. In 2021, he also served concurrently as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Deputy Prime Minister. Before entering politics, Minister Fraser had a successful legal career with one of Canada's top-ranked law firms where he practiced commercial litigation and international dispute resolution. Minister Fraser is a longtime volunteer having served as the vice president of a local branch of United Nations Association in Canada, acted as a research fellow with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, and provided pro bono services to the local BGC club and vulnerable community members. Minister Fraser holds a law degree from Dalhousie University, a master's degree in public uh, international law from Leiden University in the Netherlands, and a bachelor of science from St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, Minister Fraser, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to join you here today. Thank you. And then we have Professor Azal Lahar with us, who is an educator, an author, and leadership consultant. Uh, he works with senior leaders on culture, inclusion, retention, and becoming an employer of choice. He helps leaders amplify their strategic talent agenda by attracting and retaining diverse talent and improving bottom line results. Azar has worked as senior human resources professional in South Africa and Canada, and is currently professor of human resources at Seneca College in Toronto. Azar, welcome. Thank you, Boris. Lovely to be here. Hello, Minister. A pleasure to have you. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for the session, a fellow HBS Club of Toronto officer, Jenny Lam, who is the president of Webpad, a global entertainment company and storytelling app used by 94 million people every month. She has spent most of her career in scaling consumer tech 
And prior to Wattpad, Jenny led growth and user acquisition at Shapeways, the world's largest 3D printing service. She has also worked at Yahoo as director of platform strategy and mobile payments company GoPago as the head of marketing and business intelligence. Before her starting career, she spent three years as a management consultant at Accenture. Jenny is a founding member of the Coalition of Innovation Leaders Against Racism, a board member of the Canadian Club of Toronto, and board advisor for women and color. Jenny has an MBA from HBS and a Bachelor's of Science in Policy Analysis and Management from the Cornell University, and serves both alumni organizations in Toronto. Jenny, welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Hi, everyone. And Jenny, over to you for our discussion. Awesome. We're going to get this conversation started because I think we have a lot to say. Boris, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to have this conversation today because it is World Refugee Day, which is really about celebrating and honoring refugees around the world. And today we're going to do that by hearing from two people who have such a refined perspective of the role that refugees and immigrants play in Canada's culture, Canada's economy, and Canada's future. Um, I've had individual conversations with the both of you, and um, it's going to be a, a, a fun activity, I think, for all of us to be able to go through this together. As Boris mentioned, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A um, opportunity at the end of our conversation. Uh, and um, my goal for everyone today is that you, we all leave this conversation um, with a much deeper understanding of how immigration is addressing some of Canada's pressing economic and social issues, as well as inspire you with the stories that have inspired us. Um, and what, what's led me to this conversation? Why am I the person who's sitting in between Minister Fraser and Azar? And it's because I moved to Canada seven years ago with a two-year horizon. I was like, I'm gonna be in Canada because Canada's number one export is really nice people. And I met myself a Canadian partner in the US and he brought me up here and I thought I'll be here for two years, see how it goes, move right back to New York. Um, I joined a company, Wattpad, which was founded by two immigrants to Canada. And I can honestly say that I've never been so fulfilled in my career. And as such have stayed in at Wattpad for seven years. Um, and Wattpad exited Last year, uh, as, a, as a VC founded company exited last year as one of Canada's largest tech exits uh, in consumer tech. Um, and so there's this incredible success story of a company founded by immigrants um, based in Toronto, which is absolutely a secret sauce for the company. Uh, and I've had such incredible opportunities along the way and I've met people with such strong values and I've found um, such a vibrancy in Canada that, and, and also such great weather, just great weather here all year long, um, <laughs> that I've found myself a new home um, and I became a Canadian citizen in December. And I wanted to share with everyone here, this is my Canadian citizenship certificate, which is signed by Minister Fraser at the bottom. <laughs> it's a real honor. Um, thank you, thank you both. And Azar, I was inspired by the stories that you shared in your book, Journey to Home. Um, for everyone on the call, I was in a room with 30 other people who, uh, by the end of the night, we had all tears and we're sharing our own immigrant stories and how, um, how we've been so touched. And so I'm going to now kick it over to you. Um, I'm going to ask you both, but I'm going to ask Minister Frazier to start, if you can tell us about your own journey to this conversation today. Um, first of all, uh, Jenny, congratulations on your citizenship, and it gives me an uh, inexplicable and unreasonable amount of joy to, um, uh, to have had my signature attached to someone who's making such an extraordinary contribution to our country and to, uh, to the city where I find myself here, here today. Um, well, folks, I, in terms of my, my journey towards uh, being somebody who cares about uh, immigration, um, you most people I don't think wake up one day and find themselves uh, Minister of Immigration without having been engaged with the, uh, the, the subject, at least to, to some degree. Uh, so rather than give you a perspective as, as Canada's Minister of Immigration, uh, let me tell you about uh, being somebody who comes from the hometown where I grew up. Uh, I'm from rural Nova Scotia. Um, there was probably 150 people in the community where I grew up and eight of them were my family. Uh, the local population center where I live now has got about uh, 9,500 people and there might be 25,000 or so in the, in the area. Um, I've watched immigration change my hometown uh, for the better. Uh, it has been transformed in a lot of ways. Uh, when I was thinking about putting my name on the ballot back in 2015, uh, I started thinking to myself, 
uh, why would you do this? Uh, and uh, I wanted to do a service for my hometown uh, because I was a, uh, I, I grew up in a big family with five sisters and I went down uh, thinking about my, which, uh, which of my sisters are, were ha having an opportunity to work back home. Had, 10 years before, had you asked us what we would have wanted to do, we, none of us would have had a clue, but we all would have wanted to be close to home, close to our family. Uh, my oldest sister became a family doctor and moved to Ontario. Uh, my next oldest sister became a chiropractor and moved to Ontario. Uh, I became a lawyer and moved out west uh, to Alberta. Uh, my next oldest sister uh, became a teacher. She was not too far from home, but she was parenting full time while her husband was flying in at a, out of different locations around the world for work. Uh, the next oldest sister moved out of province for work. And the youngest sister had to move to the biggest city in Nova Scotia a few hours away to find a job. And I thought to myself, if I could do something to create opportunities for young people to move in and stay in the community that have given so much to me, that would be meaningful. Um, at the same time, a big report came out, the Now or Never report, or, or as it's known in Nova Scotia, the Ivany report. And the number one takeaway from that work that Ray Ivany did, who was the head of our community college system in Nova Scotia, uh, was to point to the fact that without immigration, uh, we should expect our communities to uh, essentially die over time if we don't take action. Uh, we embraced immigration really around the beginning of the Syrian refugee resettlement initiative. And I'll tell you right now, um, the difference between that, the, that period 2015 now is completely uh, game changing. Uh, the biggest challenges I had back in 2015 with so many young people moving away was the closure of a local elementary school and the loss of the mental health unit at our largest regional hospital. Today, the biggest challenge I have at home is whether we can build houses enough because so many people are trying to move to the area. And I can tell you as an elected official, it is a much better problem to have that you need to build houses so quickly to accommodate people who want to come to your community than losing schools and hospitals because so many people are leaving. Uh, when I saw my community, who's notoriously friendly, by the way, around the world, people know that rural Nova Scotians are friendly. I don't think we were always as, we were always as welcoming as we could have been or as we are today. Um, when I saw my community wrap our arms around uh, Syrian refugees and, and give them an opportunity, not just to be safe, but to make a contribution, we have global success stories uh, like Peace by Chocolate, where a, a family started a business that is now employing dozens and dozens of people in a small town where uh, not 30 seconds from where I was born uh, that have actually put people to work in large numbers. They're one of the largest employers in the community. Uh, when I see uh, long-term care facilities embrace economic resettlement of displaced people in a, in a way that is so not notable that when I have meetings around the world, people ask me if I've heard of Glenhaven Manor and I say, oh yeah, Fran Tyler's mom that I used to go to church with lives there because it's five minutes from my home. Something has changed in our psyche, and what I've seen it do is create a more vibrant and dynamic community that is attracting people, both newcomers and people who've been Canadian for generations, to come to our community or to move back home. I want to share this experience with the rest of Canada. Whether you're talking about uh, immigrants or refugees, it's very clear to me that, that people who arrive in Canada for the first time bring so much more than the contents of their suitcase. To the, uh, to the extent that I've seen benefits of immigration, it feels very typical to me. Now, as the Minister of Immigration, I get to see it every day, people who are transforming their community and building Canada for the future. And just to conclude on sort of my journey, I can't help but reflect after that uh, lovely land acknowledgement uh, that with the exception of uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, every Canadian has their origin story built on the back of a migrant. Uh, immigration is not something that we do. It is who we are. It is who we have been since before Confederation. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have my eyes opened in this role, and I hope to share the success that my hometown has experienced uh, with others while I uh, have the good fortune of holding this position. Go ahead, Azar. I, I am so looking forward to my first trip to Nova Scotia in July, and um, you've painted such a beautiful picture, and I, and I will make an effort uh, to be a, a, you go see Peace by Chocolate and have some lovely conversations. You write um, the stories coming out of Nova Scotia, uh, proceed in terms of people's friendliness, etc. So I'm looking for my, forward to my summer vacation in, um, in, in a few weeks' time. Um, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Minister Fraser. Um, I, my journey, I, I, I grew up in 
apartheid South Africa. And if many people don't know, apartheid was a legal segregation or what they call separateness. I, I was fortunate enough to see and witness the release of Nelson Mandela in 1994. And over the past 20 years, my family and I have made Canada our home. Um, my day job includes uh, teaching, which I love. I worked in the corporate world for a number of years and um, moved into teaching about 10 years ago with the view of trying to make an impact and to be able to change the life of one person. And the gratitude of being able to change the life of a single student gives me the greatest pleasure that I've, I've, I've ever experienced. Um, I've been in Canada, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and, and, and my whole goal is to be able to uh, have an impact in the small way that I can. And by compiling the stories of immigrants, refugees, perhaps change the mind of one or two people who will be able to see immigration uh, differently and understand why it's necessary for our country. So that is my story and I will speak more and I'll embed more as we go on to the discussion today. Azar, can you, can you share with us, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually show everyone a copy of the, of the book that you put together called Journey to Home. Could you share with everyone what caused you, what, what spurred you to write the book and, and some themes uh, that you got from it? Yeah, thanks, Annie. You know, I, I drew inspiration for this book from a, from a quote that I read by Quam McKenzie, who wrote a piece in the Toronto Star saying that Canada has been built by immigrants and they are our future. And uh, as we all know, the past decade has brought tremendous change and turmoil. It has also been a time of extreme divisions and, and of people coming together to take action, whether it's the LGBTQ rights, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, marijuana legalization, decriminalization, climate change, indigenous rights, it goes on and on. And at this level of change, we've never seen in our history before. The book Journey to Home um, presents a rich tapestry of diverse immigration um, experiences. Um, really, this, this collection has been a, a labor of love for me and each story has given me a new understanding of what it means to be Canadian. Uh, the, the book is a testament to what people experience and is meant to serve as a guide for future newcomers as well. The stories are inspiring. Um, some are funny, some sad, some are triumphant, some not. I like to compare the different voices in the book to music that changes tempo and keeps you interested as you read the book. Although there are many triumphant immigration and refugee stories, there's still a layer of sadness and a layer of disappointment weaved in these stories. The contributors to these stories are the heroes of their own stories. And, and this book reflects their true feelings um, and their hearts. My, my hope by writing this book is that the book will raise awareness of the impact that immigrants and refugees make in Canada, politically, socially, culturally, intellectually, scientifically, all aspects of our community to make us better and to allow us to be able to um, embrace um, people coming from all over the world, and especially on this particular day, refugees. You, you mentioned that there were three themes that really came to light from, from your investigation. Would you be able to share that with us today? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think when I do mention the three themes, um, you will not be surprised by the first theme. The first theme, so the, the book itself is a compilation of 40 different stories. Uh, from people who've come to Canada um, over the, over the, for at least, who've been in the country for at least five years. Um, the, they cover 32 different countries and it's a diverse collection of stories for people who have made an impact. The three themes, uh, the first one is hope, which is what we expected. Uh, most people leave their homes for better life for, for themselves and their loved ones. So hope was a key theme that came through uh, all of the stories. The second theme was a struggle for recognition of education and professional credentials and previous work experience. So we were aware that this would come through, but it was so evident throughout the stories, the challenges that many professionals face with having accreditation of their education and their background to be able to make the experience even better. And the third theme took me and my co-author really by surprise. Um, it, it was the irony of this, it was, it, it was the allegiance that immigrants felt with the indigenous people. So the irony is that those who had just arrived were identifying more easily with those who were here before them. So they were concerned about issues around discrimination uh, and, and the way that the, our indigenous peoples have been treated. And that theme came through throughout, which was a theme that um, really surprised us and, and, and kind of uh, forced us to be uh, um, 
add a story at the end of the book, which, which documents an, an indigenous story. Obviously, indigenous peoples are not immigrants. Uh, they are the only exception that we have. And the book ends up with a story from there. So if I may, I would like to briefly mention three stories related to professional accreditation to give you a sense um, of, uh, of some of the themes related to this topic. The first story is called Two Journeys, One Destination, and it's a story from India. And I quote, in those first five years, the challenge was to face the hurdles related to my education equivalency and getting accreditation from the professional engineers of Ontario. To top it all, I had to go to university and repeat the same subjects that I did once before. I realized that even after graduation, there was no guarantee of employment because I faced racism every which way I turned. The second story is a story from the Netherlands and it's called One Foot in Canada. I felt I had a solid education and 13 to 14 years of valuable professional experience. I sent out roughly 100 letters and resumes to companies. No one result, not one resulted in an interview. I reached out to some HR professionals in Toronto who proceeded to tell me that I was a hard sell. My work experience was challenging to explain. People had a difficult time understanding my work experience and in another country, I felt that I was ready to go back to the Netherlands. The third story is a story from Uzbekistan. It's called, I obtained what I could not predict. Before coming to Canada, I received a PhD in mathematics and worked as an assistant professor at the National University of Uzbekistan. My first 12 months were working part-time in various places and offering private mathematics lessons. I could not find a permanent teaching or research positions at, at, a, at, at a university. I took a position at Best Buy, which involves sales and performance analytics. So, Minister, my, my, my question to you is, um, is, you know, given the context of these three stories, do you think we are doing enough to help immigrants and refugees transition to work? What, is it, what, what more can we do to integrate in internationally qualified professionals into the workplace? Uh, look, thank you. And I, I was listening with great interest to the, the examples that you shared as well, because uh, I, I can tell you from my own experience that uh, it, it's rare I go through a week without uh, hearing something very similar. Um, look, there's, so to answer your question, no, uh, I, I don't think we're doing enough. And, and uh, I'll elaborate to explain what more I think we can do. Um, so, so first, there's the reason that we uh, don't do enough, in my opinion, is not because people don't have the political will or understand the need to do more. Um, there's some real challenges when it comes to the recognition of foreign credentials that immigration ministers have been trying to figure out, frankly, for, for decades. Um, and when you sit in federal politics, you quickly realize that uh, many, many, many of the workers who have been trained in a different profession that come to Canada uh, fall within a, a provincially regulated uh, system. And, and to defend my provincial counterparts, uh, for very good reasons in many instances, um, provinces have uh, hived off the recognition of qualifications to independent bodies that are designed to protect uh, the, the profession and, and to promote public trust within those professions. Um, that said, that is cold comfort to somebody who's coming here and wants to make a contribution. And frankly, we need people, we desperately need people. And I hope we can get into the reasons why uh, for both economic and demographic reasons over the course of this conversation. Uh, where I'm seeing some real opportunities for success that could change the way that we um, more uh, expeditiously facilitate the ability of newcomers to work uh, come from uh, employer-based uh, programs. What we're seeing right now, and we've got a unique moment in time to test and scale cer certain ideas uh, that are part of the Canada's immigration framework. Uh, so if I look at programs like the, in my region, Atlantic Immigration Program or the Rural and Northern uh, Immigration Pilot, uh, what we're seeing right now is when employers find the candidate that they want to hire because there's an existing labor shortage, uh, that person is coming in and is going to be working right out of the gates. And when we see that a little bit more of an investment is put into a person as they begin their employment, whether they're a newcomer as an, as an immigrant or a refugee, the retention rate for that employer goes through the roof. Uh, they save money on training costs. They don't have to have interruptions to their, uh, their uh, human resources when they have a person inevitably leave their, their job. And the level of loyalty that I see amongst newcomers who've been treated well by their employers is absolutely astounding. 
Um, you know, and sorry to bounce around. I'll, I'll get back to your question in, in 10 seconds here. I just want to share an anecdote from a recent visit to uh, the Center for Newcomers in, in Calgary that I made a couple of months ago. Uh, I was commenting about some of the um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit uh, that I, uh, I've witnessed with certain um, uh, newcomers. And one of the hosts that day stopped me in my tracks. She said, why do you think that is? And I gave a few reasons about the different stories I'd heard, largely drawing on, on sort of cultural factors from different parts of the world. Um, and the fact that we're dealing with people who were willing to work hard enough to build a new lives for themselves on the other side of the country. And she said, just so you know, racism has an awful lot to do with it. Uh, you highlighted on this uh, as error. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people start businesses because nobody's going to hire them. And if we can overcome that barrier, uh, we're going to solve an awful lot of other problems. Um, the other kinds of things to revert back to a more direct answer to your question. Um, one of the things that I see as a unique opportunity uh, is coming through a, a program in Nova Scotia through what's called the Employment Mobilities Pathways Pilot. It's a program designed to help businesses and employers hire uh, displaced people who happen to have the skill set that they want. There is a pipeline of talent out there that is desperate to be gobbled up, and we can do the right thing from a humanitarian point of view and an economic point of view. I don't view them to be mutually exclusive. In particular, there are internationally educated nurses, uh, and we know that there is a structural labor shortage in healthcare that will last for decades. Um, there is a project underway right now to build a train facility that will bring people who already have the skills we need and expedite their qualification shortly after they arrive. So rather than sending back to a university a degree where they have to take all the same courses for four years, we're going to be able to do that in a matter of months because we've already identified that they have all the skills necessary to uh, take part in the, uh, in the profession. There's some really unique ideas going on around this, but there's one other uh, piece that I'll draw your attention to. I I've seen a few initiatives where local organizations that are focused on growing local economies have embraced uh, the mission of encouraging small and medium-sized employers to start looking for newcomers to fill gaps in their labor force. Um, going back to the, the mentality that employer-driven programs actually really work to overcome foreign credential recognition obstacles, um, if we can get small and medium-sized businesses to say, immigration is not that scary, a growth strategy to adopt, if you have somebody who can hold your hand through that first application process, all of a sudden it becomes something people are good at. To, to, from my perspective, these are the kinds of things that we need to continue to embrace, whether it's training when people get here, embracing employer-driven programs, or better understanding why people end up in certain kinds of professions due to social factors, including racism. I, I think we'll have a much better opportunity to welcome people and, and frankly, to promote our self-interest by encouraging people to join Canada working at the level where they left off in their country of origin rather than making them start again and take a decade to play catch up. I'm so glad you mentioned that we have a shortage of labor in the health sector. Given the pandemic, that that situation has been exacerbated. And, and, I, and I do hope that in the coming years, the issue around talent within the health sector is resolved. And I'm glad to hear that there's some initiatives in place to be able to make sure that that, uh, that does uh, actually happen. I'm curious, um, but, but you had also mentioned um, you something that you want to get back to, which I think the audience would be really curious to hear. Really, around what do what do leaders need to know to understand why we need strong, supportive immigration policies and refugee policies? What what is the relationship between immigration and and our growth? Which one of us is this for? Well, that's for you, Minister Fraser. Yeah, good, good, good. That's a good um, one for you. Look, there. I I don't think there's a relationship. I think they're one and the same. 100% um, of Canada's labor force growth is coming from immigration. Uh, it's, it's that simple to me. Uh, look, there are other things we can do to grow our economy as well. But let, let's put this in, in the, the economic context that we're living in right now. Canada's economy is running really, really hot. Uh, coming out of this pandemic in particular, uh, we've now seen 117% of the jobs lost during the pandemic have been recovered. GDP is in excess of pre-pandemic levels. And our unemployment rate is literally at the lowest level in recorded history in Canada. Despite the success, a couple of months ago, there was almost a million empty jobs in Canada. We cannot fill those jobs uh, quickly with, through automation, or, or we cannot fill them with Canadian workers because our unemployment rate is so low. If we choose not to compete in the race for talent globally, and Canada is the top destination in the world for workers who are thinking about leaving their country, 
we're going to miss the boat on the biggest economic opportunity of our time. And we happen to have, in my view, a competitive advantage that almost no other country in the world has. And that's the fact that we're welcoming towards newcomers. When I'm in the House of Commons, now I'm sure to a different degree, different parties might have different views on immigration, but every, every party that's represented in the House of Commons is generally supportive of immigration in Canada. They believe it's a good thing. There are some fringe parties who are not represented who take a different point of view. We may disagree on the precise number in our immigration levels plan, but the fact that we don't have an attitude that creeps into our politics um, that's anti-newcomer is something that is, is, is such an incredible tool to grow our economy. Um, when I look at the uh, fact that uh, an enormous portion of our healthcare workers are, are newcomers, an enormous portion of our entrepreneurs are newcomers, uh, every employer in my hometown and everybody else's hometown has a help wanted sign in the window right now. Um, we are at a once in a century opportunity where the entire world simultaneously is thinking about changing their job or doing their work remotely or doing their work differently. Canada at this moment in time has a labor shortage and is also the top destination of choice globally of anywhere in the world. If we can't use this moment in time to attract talent to fill gaps in the labor force and grow our economy, we never will. And it's also going to head off at the past the greatest demographic threat that we are facing, which is our aging population. Rewind the clock half a century, there were seven workers for every retiree. Today there's three. When I'm ready to retire, there will be two on our current trajectory. If we don't embrace immigration, we will not be able to afford education or hospitals or roads or basic infrastructure in our communities. Uh, so from my perspective, this is a no-brainer. Uh, it would be a decision not to embrace immigration as a growth strategy, and that's a decision we can ill afford to make. Sorry, I think you had shared with me a, um, a backlog number that this might be a good opportunity to ask, how do we help fulfill this vision and this important need? Yeah, so just this, just this, this morning, so, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned it, our, uh, our economic success is linked to getting talent and the pipeline is, is, is not enough. And I'm just trying to, um, you know, just this morning, um, uh, data from uh, Immigration, Refugee and Citizen Canada, your department, said that we have a backlog of 2.4 million people awaiting citizenship or residency in Canada. And applications, uh, you know, are up by 250,000 since early May. So what you say is right. We need the talent. We have people waiting to come here who want to contribute, who want to make an impact. Why is there such a backlog? Why, why can't we not expedite uh, internationally qualified professionals back in the, into our economy and make a difference? Um, so th those are two separate questions, and I'm, I, I think if we're, uh, th th the answer to your second question is we can be expediting uh, internationally uh, qualified uh, workers to join the economy. Uh, but just on, on the question of just the, the pressures that the immigration system is, is facing and the number of cases in the, in the inventory right now, um, if we're going to solve this, we got to understand where, where the problem came from. Uh, let me explain where it came from, but give you some hope that there's a solution on the horizon because I'm finally seeing a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of uh, how we're going to get through this. Uh, so look, it, it really came from um, uh, chiefly from the pandemic, but there's also an impact from certain humanitarian responses we've launched. Um, during COVID-19, uh, due to public health measures, not just in Canada, but all over the world, a lot of our offices were physically shut down. Uh, some of the offices that we have around the world uh, could not allow people to work from home because they don't have uh, internet connections or we don't have protocols in place to protect people's personal information tied to their immigration files, which sometimes can be tied to their safety and refugee resettlement initiatives. Uh, so we weren't able to allow people to work from home in every office around the world the way we could in Canada. Uh, at the same time, because we shut down our borders, uh, you can imagine borders are a pretty important thing when it comes to immigration. Um, when you shut down your borders to protect the public against the spread of COVID-19, uh, we wanted to make sure we still met our goals for resettlement that year, which caused us to pivot our strategy towards resettling more people who were in Canada with temporary status. At the same time, applications from all over the world kept coming in. Uh, so we essentially have a couple of years years of applications that have built up in the pipeline that we need to deal with. And if you layer on top of that, the response to Afghanistan and our department has received over a million communications from people hoping to be part of the program. And now Ukraine, uh, where we've taken in more than 300,000 applications in a matter of uh, weeks, really a few months, um, it becomes very obvious where the volume comes from. 
Now, uh, all of that said, that that's the problem. Uh, what's the solution? Uh, we need to put resources into the system, adopt policies that allow us to chip away at those cases and completely revamp the technology that we use. So on resources, there are resources in place now that are having a massive impact. We hired more than 500 new staff, $85 million in the economic and fiscal update to work on our temporary lines of businesses, $385 million in the federal budget to start improving client service for people who are working their way through this process. Uh, on policies, uh, there's a hundred I could talk to you about, but the main one is our immigration levels plan. We're not gonna get through a large number of uh, uh, cases that are waiting to be processed if we don't have a large number of spaces that we can actually bring those people into. That's why we have major ambition. Well, one of the reasons why we have major ambition in our immigration levels plan that I tabled in the House of Commons last year. Uh, finally, on technology, we are in the midst of the biggest biggest digital platform modernization in the history of our department. I, I would dare argue that it's the biggest digitization of any government uh, department in, in Canada's history. I think some of my colleagues may fight me on that one. Uh, but the kinds of things that we're doing are giving people real-time information about their case in their pocket so they don't have to call IRCC or their MP who will call the office on the other side of the world, get somebody to go to the file room, pull out the paper. Uh, we can go digital. By this summer, 17 lines of business will have digital applications. Our citizenship process has gained massive efficiencies since we've digitized it over the course of the last year. My vision for immigration is to get rid of as much paper as is possible. You'll need to maintain some ability for people who can't access a computer to still use the system. But to the extent we can leverage these efficiencies, we can get rid of the inventory of cases that we're dealing with, but then be left with a more efficient system on the back end. Just to say what all this means so it doesn't sound like a bunch of uh, talking points, by the end of this year, uh, virtually every line of business that we offer will be back to the service standard that we had in place before the pandemic. The uh, one exception is probably citizenship will spill into next year. Um, the, uh, th that's um, a, a massive, massive improvement. But I just want to make a, a big clarification on what's really important when people talk about a backlog. Having a large number of cases of people who want to come to Canada is a good thing. What's important is that they have predictability and processing times. You can have a large number of people as long as they're not waiting forever. So if we get back to service standard uh, of 12 months for permanent residency, we're actually there now for family reunification, six months for a, a work permit, or 60 days rather for a work permit. If people have predictable shortened timelines, if there's a large number and you're still meeting those timelines, that's a good thing. So what I'm focused on is, are we meeting the processing timelines we set for ourselves more than the number of cases in the queue, which fluctuate based on your humanitarian responses at the time? Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned Ukraine. And I have a question um, later on about Ukraine, but I just wanted to touch on something else that you mentioned uh, is about the uh, increase in the number of immigrants we will be welcoming over the next three years. So. Um, and, and I'll quote you, Minister, you says, our focus remains on supporting our economic resurgence through increased retention of newcomers in regions with real economic, labor, and demographic challenges. In 2022, this year, we've increased the number of permanent residents to 431,000. Um, 2023, 448,000. And 2024, 451,000. So this is welcome news for many people. We've increased this substantially. Yet, historically, over, over time, we've not been able to meet those targets. So we, we set those targets and we always come, and short, come short. Do you think that that narrative will change? Uh, I think it's already changed. And I don't think that because I'm a hopeful and optimistic person. I think that because I've looked at the numbers. Um, last year, uh, despite the challenges associated with operating an immigration system during the pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, we had a, a target to break the record at 401,000. Uh, new permanent residents, and we processed 405, or landed rather, 405,000. Uh, this year, we've got a target, as you've indicated, uh, just over 431,000. Uh, we are not yet halfway through uh, the year, uh, and we have more than exceeded uh, 200,000 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and at that marker, just to put it into perspective, that's a month and a half faster than we've ever done it before, which was back in, in 2016. Um, we actually have a pretty sophisticated system and ability to predict where we're going to be based on the number of people who are coming uh, and who are applying. And in addition to the 200,000, I should say there's a landing inventory of 100,000 people who are approved. And the only thing they need to do to claim their permanent residency is show up. 
uh, it's a remarkable thing, the number of people that were actually having land in Canada uh, this year and last year alone. Uh, so I, I'm not worried about not meeting our targets. And look, if the border shut down due to future uh, pandemics, uh, then that changes things. Mm -hmm. But on the track we're on now, uh, we will uh, more than meet our target. Uh, and uh, and I'm very excited to see the, um, uh, the, the ability, despite all of the challenges that we're facing across different lines of business, uh, to process this people at this rate. It's, it's been a remarkable thing to watch. One of them, um, Azar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question here, and I know you had some questions on, on uh, Ukraine that you also wanted to get through. Yeah. Um, Minister, I think one of the most exciting things as an, as an immigrant for me has been to learn about all the different pathways and pilot programs. Um, could you share a little bit of uh, some of the ones that you're most proud of? Um, sh sure. And, and Jenny, if you'll allow me, I've got the chat box up here too. A lot of people interested in the postgraduate work permit extension, and I know this is one that impacts people's mental health when they're not sure of the status they may have. I just want to give people a, a cause to take a deep breath. I expect that we're going to have details ready within days for people who are looking at these programs. Our goal is to try to extend eligibility for the program to capture more people who were not necessarily included in a previous announcement, because from my view, people who've been working in Canada have Canadian experience uh, are, that are trying to continue to work in a job they already have are, are people that we don't want to lose. Uh, so there will be more details uh, within a few days, and I wanted to, uh, to give that comfort to people who may be tuned in who've posted questions. So thank you for participating. Um, some of the other programs that I'm incredibly proud of, Look, as an Atlantic Canadian, I got to say the Atlantic Immigration Program, uh, the very first thing I did was make that pilot program permanent um, after I was appointed as minister because I've seen it change my hometown. Uh, I talked about the demographic challenges that we're having. Canada is facing a tidal wave of an aging population and my community is on the front edge uh, front, front of that wave. Uh, if we don't address our demographic challenges, this tidal wave is going to pull us all underwater. Um, to see that we've got these programs that, sure, they're tied to an employer, but were motivated by the need to address demographic challenges is really remarkable. Uh, and what we're seeing is people are coming in, but their families are entitled to come on the principal application. So we've got... Uh, ...terms of young families showing up in communities as a result of these... ...not just in our biggest cities. I'm so thrilled as well about. Is he cutting out? Yep. Let's see if we can get him back. Canada, but it's not very flexible in terms of how it's going to uh, actually meet the needs of the local labor market. Oh, I, have I lost you? You did for a minute, but we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, my, my computer's acted up here. Um, but uh, th this flexibility that's going to be uh, built into Canada's immigration system is going to allow us not just to target people who have the greatest number of university degrees, but the people who have the greatest educational work experience in sectors and regions where those skills are needed. To see the, uh, that we'll be able to use a scalpel instead of a sledgehammer to bring people that will make the greatest contribution to Canada is going to forever change Canada's immigration system. I, I could go on for a uh, hundred years about this, but there's one more I've mentioned I don't want to lose sight of. The Employment Mobilities Pathways pilot could change the way that the world thinks of refugees. Uh, bringing people to our country who happen to be displaced, not because they're displaced, but because they have the skills we need, is the kind of thing that will change the world. Uh, Canada is actually the chair of the Global Task Force on Labour Mobility. Um, it is a, I've seen people come to my community who are absolutely some of the best employees in long-term care. Uh, we are actually the community that's building out that educational facility I talked about, but it's not just long-term care. To see this program, EMPP, uh, have people at home say, refugees are not here as charity cases, they're here as essential workers. Um, I don't think refugee resettlement has to be motivated by altruism. If it's motivated by self-interest, it could actually help uh, empty the world's refugee camps and take pressure off nations that can honestly not handle the volumes that they're dealing with. I think Canada has a moral obligation to uh, do more to address the migration crisis around the world. We are blessed to be surrounded by three oceans with the United States at the southern border. Uh, if if we can prove uh, that we can welcome people here as economic migrants, despite the fact that they may be a refugee, um, we can do something that will change the world forever. It's really, go ahead, Azar. 
Yeah, so I, I just before I, I, I get to the question on, on Ukraine, uh, maybe it's just opportunity just to be able to, uh, if I may, just to read a few short stories to kind of kind of get to this. I'm, I'm also uh, want to give some time um, for, for questions. I see there's a number of questions in the chat. So um, I'd just like to read a few stories and then and then ask my, my final question on Ukraine. The story, the story started, I came to Canada by chance. This is in, um, a story, um, it says, uh, as an immigrant with no family or support structure in place, juggling school and financial pressures, at the same time was incredibly challenging. I had to work as a security guard at night and then attended class during the day. Getting out of bed was a challenge, but I never let my situation stop me from achieving my goals. This is a story from a Ghanaian immigrant who is now uh, finishing his articles as a Canadian immigration lawyer. The second story is a story from Guyana, and it's called a help I held to hope and optimism. While Canadian society and workplaces are advancing at being inclusive of newcomers, I think more can be done to reflect the best of what each one brings to the table at all levels. Moreover, to thrive in the, futures, in the future economy, Canada must be a lot more innovative, creative, and comfortable with taking risks. The final story is a story from a refugee from Nicaragua. It's called From Rags to Riches to Canada. I remember when I was looking for a job, the first question employed asked was if I had Canadian experience. How can you get Canadian experience if you have never lived or worked in the country? So, Minister, one of one of the one of the one of the questions that's top of mind, and, and for, for most people, is that you know the UNC, um, HCR is estimated the number of people displaced by war, violence, persecution, human rights abuses. It's about 90 million. It was at the end of 2021, and a further four million refugees have fled Ukraine since the war started in February 2022. I know that our Prime Minister has been quite vocal um, about the war in Ukraine. Do you, what is Canada doing to help refugees in general, and specifically, specifically Ukrainian refugees um, in dealing with the crisis that's happening in, uh, in Ukraine? Uh, so look, Canada, in my view, is, is the best in the world when it comes to refugee resettlement. Now, there are other countries who have more uh, people seek asylum within their countries. But when it comes out to uh, countries who are putting their hand up and saying, we would like people who are displaced to come to our country, uh, we, we do it better than anyone. Uh, we, uh, the UNHCR reported yesterday uh, in 2021 that Canada has once again resettled more than any other country in the world. Uh, in 2020, during the pandemic, when a lot of the world actually withdrew their supports for refugee resettlement, Canada was responsible for the resettlement of more than one third of the total number of refugees that were resettled anywhere in the world. Um, so your question, uh, what are we doing uh, in Ukraine? I, I feel obliged as well uh, to just share a little perspective on Afghanistan because the two have been uh, very important to me during my time as minister. And I, I don't want those who care about Afghanistan to think uh, that because a new crisis has emerged, we've forgotten one that we have a moral obligation to continue our response to. And, and the two provide very interesting dynamics to understand that no two crises are the same uh, and, and no two are... Uh, demand the identical response. Uh, with respect to Ukraine, uh, we had the advantage of, of an early warning system to some degree because we were monitoring troop movements along the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine with Russian forces. Um, we started an internal task force on January 19th, more than a month before the invasion began, and we started understanding what we could do to prepare including moving mobile biometrics units to the neighboring region, sending teams of people to the region to process people if we saw uh, large numbers of, of uh, people seek uh, or flee, flee Ukraine. Uh, people who are fleeing Ukraine also have access to travel throughout continental Europe and are not necessarily in a territory that has become fully controlled by their persecutor. Um, Canada also has the advantage of having an enormous number of people of Ukrainian heritage who have family and are willing to help with the cost of getting them here very quickly. So we started a new special pathway, uh, the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. If I could do it again, I'd probably come up with a better acronym for the program. Uh, but uh, this program allowed people to get here. Uh, and we essentially said, we don't have capacity in a refugee resettlement uh, program. And it would take five years for us to do a meaningful amount of work, given all the other pressures. So we said, what programs do we have that have the most horsepower that allow us to respond quickly? And we discovered that our temporary, uh, our, our visitors regime, the way we welcome tourists, can process millions of people in a year. 
And we said, okay, uh, is that going to work? And when we talked to people uh, from Ukraine who were seeking to leave, very few want to stay. Uh, they want to go home at the end of this uh, when the war is won and it's safe to do so. So we created a spe special temporary pathway, which may actually be a tool that could exist for future conflicts or crises, depending on the nature of the crises, if people wish to go home at the end. We've had to build in some refugee-like supports, including access to settlement services, some income support, some temporary accommodations, not at the same degree of as people who are moving here permanently and have uh, limited to no connections to the community they're going to be moving into. Um, but by chatting with uh, people from the Ukrainian Canadian community, by making sure we boost the capacity of the settlement sector, uh, we've now been able to uh, welcome close to 40,000 people, depending on whether you count it under a special visa or, or people who may have come in could have been entitled to, we're in the ballpark of about 40,000 have come since the beginning of the year. Uh, there's not been a resettlement initiative with this many people landing this quickly in a very long time or ever. Uh, and uh, to see that there are now more than 120,000 who are approved to come uh, that are choosing not to travel right now because mostly they don't want to be too far from Ukraine is a remarkable thing when I see what can our system do if we have new and innovative policy designs. In Afghanistan, we have challenges that are unlike any other refugee resettlement initiative. And people say, why can't you do things like you did in Syria? Uh, and uh, uh, what people don't appreciate is when you're dealing with ordinary refugee resettlement, where people are several years removed from the conflict that displaced them and they've been processed by the UNHCR, you can send an airplane, load people on it and fly it to Canada. Uh, when you're dealing with a territory that's been seized by a, a listed terror entity in Canadian law, uh, with people who still can't get out and uh, neighboring countries are demanding travel documents that can only be issued by their persecutor. The challenges are like nothing I've ever seen. Uh, but because we feel we have a moral obligation to help many of those who've helped us, uh, we've stepped out with one of the largest commitments of any country in the world to resettle at least 40,000 Afghan refugees. Uh, and these are, are two twin crises that will forever be a part of me. And uh, they, they uh, eat up an enormous amount of time because of our commitment uh, to the people of both Ukraine and Afghanistan. Um, I'll, I'll leave my comments there for fear I could uh, uh, talk for far too long about this. Um, I, I will say that it gives me so much hope to see the, uh, going on as our theme that he picked up in the, in the stories, it gives me so much hope to see the level of commitment and innovation um, in all fronts, in policy, technology, and every aspect uh, that, that you're leading to really continue Canada's leadership role in this area. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of many people to say thank you. Um, Azar, thank you for sharing your, your stories. I think they're an incredibly important reminder for all of us who deal with our day jobs and thinking about this to remember the, the, the impact of the people and how, how these policies and how as individual business leaders, as individuals, we can really contribute to the resettlement of individuals, individuals in Canada. Um, I'm going to pass it now to Boris to help facilitate the many questions that we've been getting. Uh, and as a reminder, before I go, is that today is World Refugee Day and tomorrow is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And I appreciate what you said, Minister, at the beginning to say that we're all in immigrants to this country in one way or another. Boris, thanks. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, folks, we have a tremendous number of questions. Minister, uh, as you mentioned, immigration is essential to our country. Many people on this call are immigrants. Uh, folks are wondering about uh, a plethora of topics, but there's several consistent themes. And one of them is uh, integration of immigrants into the Canadian community and society. And knowing from your career thus far and your work in public service, you've touched so many departments and so many ministries uh, within our government. And so one of the questions that's coming up is how is the Ministry of Immigration, Citizenship and Refugees collaborating with others in making sure that immigrants are welcome? There's public services that are available to them. We've talked a bit about employment, but what about infrastructure? Uh, real estate prices are a concern. So how, how do you collaborate with others uh, in the cabinet? And how are you thinking of a strategy of how these immigrants are gonna be very productive uh, and, and happy in, the, in Canada as the new home. Um, so look, first I'll, I'll address some of the things that the, the government can do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the people who do the real heavy lifting, which is, is Canadians. Um, so look, I sit next to the Minister of Housing, and uh, when neither of us is taking a question and question period, I guess what we're talking about. 
Uh, how are we going to build houses to welcome uh, 1.3 million people over the next couple of years? Uh, and he'll quickly say, how are we going to build them without newcomers? And uh, the reality is we have to look at the opportunities, both from an economic um, point of view, but also a resettlement point of view, to make sure that the services and infrastructure are in place. Um, during the conversation I had with the Prime Minister, where he asked me to serve in this capacity, uh, the two of us discussed uh, what, what is our real ambition for immigration? And the, the only real limit uh, to either of us, in terms of our viewpoint on how many people Canada can handle, is the absorptive capacity of communities. Um, now, that means if we are seeking to grow to fill gaps in the labor force, we need to build schools and hospitals uh, and work with provinces to prepare them for the cost of doing so. Uh, we need to make sure that we have housing and, and municipal infrastructure to support that housing. But we also need to make sure that settlement agencies can support people who are arriving. So there's a network, for those of you who don't know, of about 550 settlement agencies that provide services to newcomers, including language training, including help in finding a job, signing up for a social insurance number, getting a bank account. Um, but it's also the soft supports. These are the people who tell uh, the kids that take skating lessons with my daughter where to find the wellness center, how to sign up for lessons. They're the people who teach uh, their parents how to run, uh, ride, ride the bus in the community. Um, it, it's incredible to me the value that they provide. Uh, because, And this is a, a nice transition point because as much as um, uh, infrastructure and government policy makes a big difference in getting people here and making sure they, they could succeed, what actually makes sure they do succeed are, are people who already live in communities that wrap their arms around them and treat them like neighbors, uh, not like strangers. And um, it's just remarkable to see the, the change that I've witnessed in my own community. I mentioned Peace by Chocolate earlier. Uh, Tara Kadad will tell you a story. Uh, when he arrived, one of the first conversations he had was with a guy in town, I won't say his name, uh, who said, look, I know you guys I didn't have anywhere to go, but why'd you come here to take our job? That was the first guy they hired at their factory. Mm -hmm. um, the number one thing that will change a person's mind about being more welcoming to a newcomer is having met one. Uh, they do a survey in Nova Scotia every year. A couple of years ago, uh, the question, and they ask the same questions year over year. And a couple of years ago, before we saw Syrians arrive in large numbers, they asked, are more immigrants good for our province? 36% of people said yes. They asked the exact same question the next year after thousands showed up. 86% of people said yes. The challenge that I see is figuring out uh, what, what was different between yes. last year and the year, uh, the next year. Everyone started meeting newcomers. Everyone saw them working on the shop floor, keeping businesses afloat where their kids are working, not taking jobs that their kid could have had. Uh, I see a golden opportunity for Canada because people have become accustomed to meeting newcomers, because we have needs in, in the economy that cannot be filled with the domestic labor force. This is our moment in time to embrace immigration as a demographic, economic, and social growth strategy. And um, I feel just immensely privileged that I get to hold the position I do to see if I can move that, uh, that, that effort forward. That's fantastic, Minister. What do you think is the vision for immigration, citizenship, and refugees for Canada five years out? Uh, look, it, it, it's, it's about meeting the needs of communities. I, I don't have some uh, number in my head that we need to hit each year. I know right now the number is more than we can currently bring in. Uh, the, uh, but that's a result of economic and demographic factors, which I've canvassed over the course of this conversation. Uh, but the reality is I, I want people to know Canada is interested in having them. I want them to have the tools to know that they will uh, be set up for success when they arrive. And I want Canadians to remember that, um, it, it, but again, with the exception of Indigenous Canadians, uh, it was you before. It, whether it was you, your mother, your father, your grandparents, or in my case, uh, several more generations. Uh, but it's not lost on me that the place where I live today is 15 minutes from where the boat washed up with Scottish settlers who were fleeing the Highland Clearances and were being persecuted 250 years ago. Uh, if you were to tell me it's a coincidence that I still live 15 minutes from where I do today with a whole a bunch of other people with Scottish last names, uh, I, I, I wouldn't understand how you have such a gap in your ability to conduct an analysis. Immigration has built our communities from before the time Canada was a country. It's going to continue to, whether we like it or not. So we may as well manage it in a way that serves the needs of our communities, because to do otherwise uh, is just uh, missing, missing the opportunity of the generation. 
Minister, thank you. I hope that all on this call are able to contribute through their entrepreneurial pursuits, through their businesses, through, like you said, welcoming and giving immigrants a, a direct or proverbial hug. Thank you, Minister Fraser, for being with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Azar. Uh, Jenny, thank you for moderating this conversation. It was a pleasure to have it with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be with you, everyone.